This is going to be an overview for the book of Romans. Romans has 16 chapters, 433 verses, and around 9,447 words. The author is the Apostle Paul. This is the epistle of Paul to the Romans. So historically, it's Paul writing to the saints at Rome, and he gives foundational truths about the Christian faith. Doctrinally, it's an exposition about our salvation today. If you want to know about our salvation today, read the book of Romans. Get familiar with this book. Inspirationally, what you'll see when you read the book of Romans is you see your need for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're going to see that you're a sinner. You can't make it on your own, and you need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, here is a quick breakdown of the book. Chapter 1. Man does not want God on his mind. And over time, if he stays that way, he'll become a reprobate. He doesn't want to retain God in his knowledge. Chapter 2. Man thinks he's good enough to make it to heaven by himself, on his own, through his own goodness. Chapter 3. But we see man is a sinner who can't make it to heaven on his own. Chapter 4, man is given imputed righteousness by faith. And Abraham illustrates it, and David describes it. So when a man realizes that he can't make it on his own because he's a sinner, and he comes to Jesus Christ by faith, that man is given imputed righteousness by faith, and that's talked about in chapter 4. Now chapter 5 talks about how man is justified by faith. And how one man brought death, which would be Adam, and one man brings life. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the first Adam and the last Adam. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. Chapter 6, you've got the spirit baptism. And that has nothing to do with water. It's something that took place inside when the moment you believed. And chapter 6 also talks about being a servant to righteousness. You need to quit being a servant to sin and to the flesh and be a servant to righteousness. Chapter 7, our body and soul were separated so that we could be married to Jesus Christ. That's what you're going to see in chapter 7. Chapter 8, it talks about waiting for the redemption of our body. We're already redeemed. But our body isn't yet. Our flesh isn't saved. When you got saved, your flesh didn't get saved. It stayed the same. So while we're presently saved, we're still waiting for the redemption of our body. And this chapter also talks about how nothing can separate us from the love of God. In chapter 9, you got Paul's heavy, heavy burden for the Jews. You'll see how Paul had a very heavy burden for lost people. Chapter 10, you're going to see how whosoever will can be saved. It's your choice to either accept Jesus Christ or reject Jesus Christ. Chapter 11, you got the great chapter talking about the restoration of the nation of Israel. Chapter 12, it talks about how you need to present your body as a living sacrifice. Chapter 13, you got the uh, chapter about the higher powers. How to, uh, how should a Christian handle the, the the higher powers. Chapter 14, you got how to handle disagreements over personal convictions between you and another Christian. Chapter 15, talks about how you need to please others like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Chapter 16, you got Paul's salutation, warning, and closing. So with that quick little breakdown, let's really just get into the book and look at some of the stuff in it chapter one in chapter one paul confirms his apostleship he talks about how he is separated unto the gospel and isn't ashamed of it paul has a desire to preach the gospel in rome and they have that saying that goes you hear people say when in rome well the best thing to do when in rome is preach the gospel like paul wanted to do so romans chapter one and verse three he says Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. 
So here, Paul says he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. You see, Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. According to 1 Timothy 3.16, he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And Mary was in the line of David. But when it comes to Jesus Christ being God, he was before David, before Mary, before Abraham, before Adam. But the fact that Paul calls Jesus Christ the Son of God in verse 3 proves that he believes in the deity of Jesus Christ. Because if you look back at John chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, Jesus Christ, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So by calling Jesus the Son of God, you actually make him equal with God. In Romans 1, 4, it says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So Paul believed in the resurrection. And just in the first few verses, you see the virgin birth of Christ and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So Paul isn't ashamed to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives that gospel very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where he says how, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So a lot of men today they're ashamed. They're ashamed of the gospel. But they're not ashamed to live wicked. They'll go and do everything crazy out in the open, out in public. But they would never get up and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's something wrong with that. Paul isn't ashamed to live righteous. He's not ashamed to preach the gospel. Men today spread a false gospel of perversion with no shame. Paul spreads the true gospel without shame. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the, the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The things you can see represent something that you cannot see. You see, the invisible things of Him from the creation are clearly seen. When you see the sun and the moon and the stars and the clouds and grass and the sky, you should be able to realize that somebody a lot bigger than you and me made all that stuff. Notice that verse says that He has eternal power. Most people today couldn't function without power. They value electricity so much Yet, they don't care to be without power when it comes to having the Lord in their life. If the power goes out and they can't play a game or watch TV, then they're heartbroken. But if they are without power when it comes to the Lord, they usually don't even care and don't even realize it. I mean, when it comes to the Lord, they live like an Amish person. They ain't got no power. When it comes to living in this world, they would never do anything like the Amish. They got to have their TV. They got to have their electricity. Most Christians, they just live like atheists. They claim to know God, but they live like they are their own God. The lost world is obviously even worse. The devil has everything fixed. He's got it all fixed up to produce as many reprobate minds as he possibly can, and he's working overtime at the factory, working doubles, working triples, working on the weekends, working the holidays, to make production and put out as many reprobate minds as he can. In Romans 1.26, it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. If a person continues just going down a path of sin, then the Lord will eventually give them over to it. And I don't believe this means they are unredeemable. 
but they get to a point where they don't even want to think about God at all. The women change the natural use into that which is against nature. They start going after other women instead of wanting a man. I mean, you can't even take the family out to eat without seeing the whole restaurant crew just full of lesbians. And then you have to explain to the kids why a woman is dressed up like a man, why two women are kissing, why these two women are holding hands and cuddling like they're a couple. I mean, thankfully, I live in Hillbilly, Tennessee. And as of right now, it's a rare thing for me to see a transvestite or some drag queen or anything like that. But we do see quite a bit of women that are what they would call full butch. I mean, I'm not really even sure what that means. I just know that is what they call it. Maybe they look like a guy named Butch. I don't know why they call it that. But uh, Romans 1.27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. So notice it says the men leave the natural use of the woman. The thing about sodomy is that it is so unnatural. It goes beyond a fleshy sin into more of a devilish type of deal. I mean, you don't want to get a soft spot for filth. But the devil is working overtime to make sure you get a soft spot for sodomy. The San Francisco sodomite choir just made a song a few months back talking about how they're coming for our children. They admitted it. They want to normalize it. They want to come for the children. It says in Romans 1.28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You see, these people don't want to retain God in their knowledge. God gives them over to a reprobate mind. If you're a reprobate, then you have a certain state of mind going on. And in this state of mind, you don't even want to retain God in your knowledge. So a, a reprobate doesn't want God, and he doesn't want to even think about being saved. So you have people saying, well, I'm afraid I'm a reprobate and I can't be saved. Well, obviously you're not a reprobate if you're, if you're wanting to be saved because you wouldn't even want to be retaining God in your knowledge. So you're worrying about that for no reason. I mean, if you desire to be saved and you want to be saved and, and you want to, to be in fellowship with God, then obviously you're not a reprobate. They don't even want to retain God in their knowledge. Someone asked me, that's, I've been asked that on several occasions, and that's how you answer that. If a reprobate doesn't want to retain God in his knowledge, then obviously he doesn't even want to be saved. He's not probably going to not even going to think about being saved. Now, I believe a person could be in a reprobate mind and then have a change of mind. I don't believe that just because a person is a reprobate right now that that's doomed forever. I personally don't believe that. Because we all had to have a change of mind when we got saved, right? So a reprobate can be saved, but he would obviously have to have a change of mind first and realize that he's a guilty sinner. Realize that God is the true God and not himself. Realize that he can't save himself. Realize that Jesus Christ is the answer. He's obviously going to have a change of mind. He's no longer going to be a reprobate anymore after that. So Romans chapter 2. Paul is going to show you God's judgment on Jews and Gentiles. And he's going to do this without respect of persons. Romans 2, 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest, doest the same things. Judging things are good. 1 Corinthians two fifteen says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judge of no man. Judging things is good. But you want to stay away from hypocritical judgment. That's what it's talking about in Matthew 7. Judge not that you be not judged. You know, you want to take the moat out of your own eye before you... You know, you want to take the beam out of your eye before you get the moat out of your brother's eye. That kind of thing. That's the type of judgment you don't want to do. You don't want to be uh, somebody that's into pornography every day and then telling your brother to quit drinking. You, you want to stay away from hypocritical judgment. 
take the beam out of your eye, then you can see clearly to get the mote out of your brother's eye. You don't want to go around judging people when you do the same things yourself. So it says, For thou that judgest doest the same things. But it says in verse 2, We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? God is good to the lost man to lead him to repentance. Putting a stumbling block in the life of a lost man is also God being good to that person. This sinner may need to hit rock bottom before he will ever come to the Lord. It says in Romans 2, 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. While me and you are treasuring up rewards for the judgment seat of Christ through our serving God and our Christian service, the lost man serves the, the flesh and he's setting up treasures for the, the wrath, the day of wrath. The day of wrath is a day that where God will pour out his wrath on the world. Lost people will feel God's wrath in hell. They'll feel it at the second coming. They'll feel it at the great white throne. And then they'll feel it in the lake of fire. Romans 2, 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? God is just. God is fair. He will have them pay according to their own deeds. The lost man who is good by worldly standards maybe provides for his family was faithful to his wife he's still going to go to hell because he's lost but he's not going to go to face as bad of a hell as a tv evangelist crook who led people astray or a pope you know god is fair god is just about how he deals with every person Romans 2, 28 and 29, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And what this saying is, if a Jew is physically circumcised and doesn't have things right inwardly, he's still going to hell. But the, but the uncircumcised guy, the Gentile, who does have things right inwardly, he's going to heaven. You see, it's not about things you do outwardly. It's about something that took place inwardly in your heart. You've got to believe the gospel. And then you actually get spiritually circumcised. Now, chapter 3. We see that Jews are not better than Gentiles, and Gentiles aren't better than Jews. Man at his best state is altogether vanity. They will all go to hell without the gospel. This chapter exposes man for what he truly is. Romans 3, 8. And not rather as we be slanderously reported. And as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Men were going around trying to say that Paul was teaching something like ultra grace. And they slandered him and would say he taught that since, you know, since we're saved by grace, then we can live like a heathen. That's what they say that he taught. But he says, And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. He's not saying that. He's not teaching that at all. He's not saying you should just live how you want to since you're saved. He says in Romans 3, 9, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. So there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. They all deserve hell. They all need a Savior. Because Romans 3, 10, and 11 says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. The average Baptist today could care less about the Word of God. If the government decided to bust into their home and take away their Bible, the only reason they would care is because it was an attack on their freedom, not because they love the Bible. The average Christian is more concerned with keeping his freedom in this country than he is about the things of God. God said there is none that seeketh after God. 
Romans 3.12 says they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, Paul is going to show you how your whole body is in a mess. In Romans 3.13, he says their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So your throat, your tongue, your lips, your mouth. Your mouth is in a mess. And that's why it says in Ecclesiastes 5.3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. Ecclesiastes 5.2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. James 3, 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Your mouth is a mess. Your feet and walk are wicked, unless they're led by God. Look at Romans three fifteen through 18. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You've got bad eyes unless you're led by the Lord. Paul goes on to explain what the law can do for you. In Romans 3.20 it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law can't justify you. It can only give you the knowledge of sin. It lets you know that you can't please God on your own. Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The only righteousness you can have that will please God has to come straight from the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment you get saved, the Lord puts the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your record. And without that, you can't be saved because Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there are some people that don't act like they have ever been saved. And we, even though we're saved by grace through faith, we need to realize that we got the righteousness of Jesus Christ on our record. We need to realize that we're only getting there because the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. But at the same time, you want to realize that you need to live as righteous as you possibly can in your day-to-day -day life. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Man at his best state is altogether vanity, but you can still try to live as right with God as you possibly can every day. I mean, you're still going to sin. You're still going to mess up and sin because John says in 1 John 1, 7 through 10, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Put those verses in the holiness preacher's pipe and let him smoke on that for a while. Put that in the church of Christ pitch pipe and let them blow on it a while. Uh, you're a sinner. You sin every day. Uh, you're not righteous enough to get to heaven. It's got to be the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have anything to do with our salvation outside of believing, then we are in an unholy mess. If I believed that I could lose my salvation, then I would keep that feeling in the pit of my stomach that feels like a panic feeling. You know the feeling you get when you almost wreck your car. The feeling that you got when you were going to the principal's office. This horrible feeling of worry and fear and doubt would be in you every day and God's not given us the spirit of fear but a power to love and of a sound mind if we were in danger of losing our salvation every day then we would be living in fear but Romans 3.24 says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus I'm justified 
freely. The best things you can get in life are free. Most most things that are free are either not really free or you have to pay something to get it, but they just call it something like a love offering or a donation. And then they give you the gift. But the Lord gives you salvation for free. There's no catch. All you got to do is believe. If you're justified, then, the, then that means the Lord has declared you righteous even though you're a sinner. You're justified just as if you never sinned. And this can only come through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If you have been redeemed, then you have been bought by the Lord. That's redemption. He bought you back. Imagine if you had a bike. So you got a bike. Someone stole it. And then you go to a pawn shop and you bought it back. You redeemed it. There was a time when I didn't know my guilt of sin. When I was young, I didn't know my guilt of sin. And I was the Lord's at that time. Because if I died, I would have went to heaven. But then when I realized my guilt of sin, I realized I was going to go to hell for those sins. And that I had to be redeemed. I was in danger of hell and I needed to be saved. You see, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died and he had to redeem me. When I realized my guilt of sin, I had to be redeemed. That's when I needed to be saved. They call that today reaching the age of accountability. And that's a different for every, every person. Because some person may realize that way before another person does. Romans 3.25 Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. You see, Jesus Christ is my justification. That is how I got declared righteous when I was a guilty dog. He's my redemption. He, he bought me just like Boaz bought Ruth. He is my propitiation, as it talks about in Romans 3.25. That means he's my substitute. He, and he took my place for sin, and he appeased the wrath of God. He's my propitiation. And all this, it doesn't come in a process, all these things, the justification, propitiation, redemption. It comes at the same time. You get it all at the same time. It comes the moment that you believe the gospel. It came when I put my faith in his blood. I got it all at once. When I believed on Jesus Christ as my crucified, buried and risen Savior, that is when I put my faith in his blood because when he was crucified for my sins, he shed his blood. Romans 3.26 To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 3.28 Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This means we are declared righteous because we put our faith in Jesus Christ to pay our sin debt. We aren't saved by keeping the deeds of the law. We are saved by doing no, no, we can't do anything to be saved. We are not saved by getting baptized. We're not saved by joining a church. We're not saved by being good to our neighbor. We are saved by doing what God says to do and that we put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he tells us to do to be saved. We aren't saved by doing any good thing. No good thing. No deed of the law you can do will save you. And that's just Bible basics. The only good works, the only good works that are required for salvation are the ones that Jesus Christ did and not you. You didn't do any of them. Now, Romans chapter 4. In this chapter, you'll see that God counted righteousness to Abraham before he got circumcised. So if God applied righteousness to Abraham before circumcision then he can apply righteousness to you before you do any works. Romans 4, 3, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Abraham believed God back in Genesis 15 about his seed. Remember in Genesis 15, 5 and 6, where it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. 
Abraham believed God about his seed. And this picture is me and you believing on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Romans 4, 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you receive salvation by your works, then this would mean the Lord was in debt to you. But the reward is not reckoned of grace, but the reward is 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 not reckoned of debt but of grace you get you get it because of grace through faith without works Romans 4 5 but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness you see God doesn't owe you anything he's not in debt to you he's given you the righteousness of Jesus Christ for free you don't deserve it you're guilty. Even if someone has no works, his faith is still counted for righteousness. You have those guys going around saying it isn't just faith alone. It isn't just faith alone, they say. But it obviously is. If you've put your trust in the Lord from the heart and you're relying on him to be your way to heaven, then that is all it took. Now, when those guys go around saying it's not by faith alone, it's not by faith alone, if they're meaning that a person who just believe the, believes the facts of the gospel and hasn't believed it from the heart, then you know you don't you're not you're not saved by just believing the facts. You're you're saved by putting your trust on Jesus Christ and what He did for you on the cross to to save you. That's how you're saved. You're not saved just by believing facts, because there's a lot of people who they say, "Well, I know that Jesus died. I know that He died on the cross. I know He existed in history, but I'm not." going to be saved there's people that's like that they're not saved but if a person believes that jesus christ is who he said he was died on the cross was buried and resurrected then that person is and and, and they're putting their faith in that and that person is saved and it's just faith alone in that sense you know nobody's saying that well we can go up to just any random person and say if you believe Jesus did this then you're saved I mean maybe that person will get saved but that person could just be believing the facts and not be willing to trust in that to save them if they're not going to trust in it to save them then they're not saved but by saying that we believe faith alone we're saying that when a person knows that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins and that he was buried and resurrected if they're going to put their faith in that to save them, they're saved. Therefore, it is by faith alone. Romans 4, 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. This is the incredible doctrine of imputation. So we've seen justification, redemption, propitiation, and now we see imputation. Notice these words that end in I'll win. And this has to do with the fact, this imputation has to do with the fact that when God saved you, He gave you, He imputed to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He imputed the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ to you. G you see, Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus Christ did everything a person would have to do to be saved by works. If we had to be saved by works, Jesus is the only person who ever did all the right works and abstain from all the bad works to where he could be saved by his own works he has all the works he has a perfect record if you looked at his permanent record it's perfect not only this not only did jesus put the righteousness of jesus christ on you but he took all your sins your sinful record and he became those sins on the cross so that he could pay your sin debt and then offer his perfect record to you. What a deal. And this all takes place the moment you believe the gospel. You get your sinful record taken away. And you get the perfect record put in place of that. So when you got saved, the Lord took out your permanent record. He tore it in half, made it disappear, and replaced it with the record of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He doesn't see... Not only does he not see your bad works that you've done in the flesh, he doesn't even see your good works that you've done in the flesh when it comes to your salvation. Because your good works 
Your good works don't even have anything to do with your salvation. Romans 4, 7, and 8, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Imputation doesn't only have to do with the fact that he gave you his righteousness. It also has to do with the fact that he doesn't impute your unrighteousness to you anymore either. So this is why sinning after salvation can't affect your salvation. It can't cause you to lose your salvation because because the, the Lord is not imputing sin to your record anymore. You see, before you got saved, all those sins that you were doing, it was going on your record. But not no more after salvation. Romans 4.18, who against hope, this is talking about Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Notice Romans 4 shows you what Abraham believed. He believed that he would become the father of many nations. He believed God about his seed. He believed God is, is going to give him a child in his old age and that nations would come of that child. In Romans 4, 19 and 20, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb who was about 90 years old. So Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90, and Abraham still believed that God was going to give them a child in their old age. It says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Notice that it doesn't mention any of Abraham's unbelief. But if you read Genesis, you'll see that Abraham laughed at God's promise, and Sarah also laughed. And that's why Isaac was named Isaac. Isaac means laughter. But this just shows you God's forgiveness. And it shows you a picture of imputation. Because God doesn't see that unbelief on Abraham's record. He only sees the faith. God's not seeing the sinful things on your record. He's only seeing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 21 and through 24 and being fully persuaded, Abraham was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. I need to be fully persuaded that what God has promised, that he'll save me and he'll keep me saved and he'll keep me out of hell. I need to be fully persuaded that what he's promised, he's able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. See, just like Abraham believed God about his seed, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham illustrates New Testament salvation. Romans 4.25, it says, Who was delivered for our justification? Oh no, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Romans 5. This chapter shows your peace and justification by faith. Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since he is our propitiation and he appeased God's wrath, we are now at peace with God. Colossians 1.20 and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Romans 5, 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You see, the strongest man on earth is without strength. When it comes to sin, death, and hell, he's without strength. I mean, you could be the strongest man in the world, you're still going to be a sinner. Strongest man in the world, he's still going to die. Strongest man in the world, still going to hell without Jesus Christ. He can't dig himself up out of hell. He has to come to Jesus Christ to get victory over those things. No matter how many times he hits the gym, without Jesus Christ, he's as good as in hell. But uh, Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. God shows his love by dying for people who didn't deserve to be died for. 
It says in Romans 5, 9, 9, Romans 5, 9, Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We are justified by his blood. Acts 20, 28 shows that it's God's blood 